Yes. Okay. Uh, warm greetings to all the brothers and sisters uh, who have joined us today uh, from the ERC team. Um, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Brother Thomas Jacob. Uh, he has been uh, teaching us faithfully on the subject of uh, Christology. Uh, we all know that Christ is uh, the center uh, of the teachings of the scripture. Uh, he is uh, the center of uh, God's uh, very affection and uh, the beloved of God the Father. And he is our beloved Savior and Lord, uh, our shepherd, the head of the church. And therefore, uh, all the great desire and uh, we have this great uh, zeal uh, to be able to study about him. Uh, we have been considering this uh, very important subject uh, in the last uh, few weeks about uh, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. We began by looking at uh, the scriptures as to how uh, the Christ pre-existed uh, before the creation. He has been from all eternity. And we looked at uh, his divine names. Uh, we looked at uh, his uh, divine, the divine worship, uh, which is attributed to him, uh, his divine qualities and attributes. Um, and finally, we considered his divine offices. Uh, today, again, we have gathered uh, to gaze upon our Lord, his beauty, uh, and his greatness, his majesty, his glory. Uh, let, us, uh, uh, let us continue uh, to look unto him, uh, for uh, he is uh, the one who is uh, worthy uh, to be gazed upon, and he is the one who is worthy to be uh, followed, uh, and we are his disciples. Uh, let us look to the Lord uh, in a word of prayer before I hand over uh, the session to Brother Thomas Jacob. Almighty God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for this morning time that you granted to us that we could uh, meet together uh, in this fashion, uh, Lord, and we could study the subject of Christology. Uh, we thank you and we praise you for uh, what a great blessing which you have blessed us with, uh, that we have come to know you uh, in our life. And as we were remembering also in the sessions uh, before, that we have come into a personal relationship uh, with uh, our Savior and our Lord. Uh, we thank you and we praise you for, uh, for as we come into your presence one, once more this morning, uh, we are able to think upon and ponder upon uh, the glory and the majesty and the beauty of our Lord and how uh, he is, uh, he's such a great God, uh, the one who, uh, is, who, who, who has been from all eternity to all eternity, the omniscient, the omnipresent, the omnipotent God, and how uh, this God, because of his love for us, uh, how he, uh, he, he was born into this world, how he took on the form of a human flesh, and how he dwelt among us, and how he died for us, and uh, today is reigning, uh, in the, uh, and he's seated on the right hand of the Father. We thank you and we praise you for, uh, we, we are able to come into your presence, and we are able to remember all these things, and we are able to offer our thanksgiving and praise and adoration to you. Lord, as we draw nigh into your presence this morning as well, uh, we especially uh, remember our dear brother Thomas Jacob, as he would be uh, once again uh, leading us and teaching us uh, on this subject of Christology. Uh, praying that you would give him all the needed grace from above, and we uh, pray that the Holy Spirit would uh, strengthen him, and that uh, uh, with the with uh, that he would be able to teach us uh, clearly uh, from your word. Uh, we pray, uh, thank you for all the brothers and sisters who have joined us from different parts of this globe, and uh, as we sit together uh, in your presence, uh, we pray that uh, you would continue to uh, lead us and guide us and uh, that uh, our worship would be uh, to you alone, and that our hearts and our attention would be on you and on your word. Uh, we uh, thank you uh, once again for this time that you've given to us. Uh, we commit uh, this uh, uh, session into your loving hands, and we pray that uh, without any sort of uh, disturbance that we would be able to sit together in your presence. Uh, we thank you once again for all your goodness to us. Uh, we ask all these things in and through the sweet and mighty and well-beloved name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, I would, uh, over to you, Brother Thomas Jacob. You can now start the session. Thank you, Brother Benson. <laughs> in the name of the Lord, be glorified. I greet you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a great joy it is to be in the presence of God and to behold the beauty of the one who has saved us the past 
four sessions, uh, I was trying to uh, bring before you the glories of our Lord Jesus Christ as described in the scripture as he is the true God. Lord will link this session and the next session we would be looking to the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can look to him as the one who is the true man, the perfect man ever lived on the face of the earth. When we uh, come to uh, the, this wonderful topic, the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are reminded of that great verse in the Bible in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, where we look to the Lord Jesus Christ as the man Christ Jesus, the one who is the true God, and he is the true man as well. Now, let me tell you that we are going to look to this beautiful subject, important subject of Christology. And we are not looking to this subject just as a scientist looking to uh, a drop of tears and understanding the chemical, uh, the uh, chemical components in that tear, that drop of tear. But we are looking to that tear with a heart, with a sense. And we are looking, trying to understand the, the truth behind the tears. So likewise, when we look to the Lord Jesus Christ and his person, we are not just dissecting various things about the Lord Jesus Christ, but we are looking to him in such a way so that our devotion to the Lord would come up and we would be able to worship him with a true heart in the days to come. He is the man Christ Jesus. Pilate said that, uh, in uh, we read in John chapter 19, behold the man. So Lord Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus, is pictured before us by Pilate as the man. He is the true man uh, ever lived in the face of the earth. When we come to the book of Zechariah, there we can see how Jehovah is bringing forth uh, his beloved shepherd before us. He is saying that the man that is my fellow, or in other words, the man that is my equal. On that cross of Calvary, as the centurion was looking to, uh, to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, he could say that uh, this man is a righteous man. Christ himself uh, said concerning him that he is the son of man. Those who listen to him, they could say that no man spake like this man. <laughs> and today we are looking to this man who is in glory. Of whom we read in Psalm 80 that he is the man of the right hand of God. So let us look to the, this man and let us understand the greatness, the majesty of his person and let us be uh, uh, worshipful in his presence. I remember a statement which I have read in my younger days that as the famous astronaut Colonel James Irwin, when he came to India, he made a statement like this that uh, it's a great thing or a great wonder for man to walk on moon. But he said like this, but God walking on earth as man is a greater wonder. So in fact, when we look to the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, it's a great wonder. God coming before us in the form of a man. When the children of Israel looked to manna, they could not understand what is it. So they gave it that name manna, which means that what is it? Yes, when we look to the Lord Jesus Christ, let us acknowledge that he is 
beyond our comprehension and understand that he is truly wonderful so when we come to uh, think upon this great truth uh, about the humanity of the lord jesus christ we can see that the scripture clearly brings before us jesus christ as true god and true man he is god and man in perfect union and why do we believe in the humanity of the lord jesus christ we believe on the humanity of the lord jesus christ because when we look to the word of god we have clear indication about his humanity uh, i have bring, uh, brought before you uh, six reasons which we have to consider to understand the humanity of our lord he had a human parentage he grew as other human beings do he has the he had the appearance of a man he was possessed of a body soul and spirit and he was subject to the sinless infirmities of humanity and human names are given to him uh, lord willing we would be considering uh, these six things uh, today and in the coming class so <clears throat> these are the various reasons why we look to the lord jesus christ and understand that he is truly human it is not a feeling that he has given that he is a man but when we look to him we can understand that just as we are the lord jesus christ lived in this world and showed himself as a real man truly there is a difference between us and the lord jesus christ that's a moral difference that we are sinful people and he was a sinless uh, uh, man but we can look to him as a real person a real man and we can understand that he was truly human when he was in this world and even today he is sitting at the father's right hand as man now let us go further and uh, we can see uh what happens if we don't believe in the humanity of the lord jesus christ is it necessary that we have to believe in the humanity of lord jesus christ there were <coughs> there were people even in the first century who were not willing to understand or believe in this great truth when we come to the epistles of john we can understand that the presence of or in the influence of gnostics who tried to adulterate the doctrine of christ they were not willing to acknowledge that jesus christ is god incarnated as man they were not willing to uh, acknowledge that jesus christ born as the true god and the true man they had various other theories concerning the humanity of the lord jesus christ or the deity of the lord jesus christ. they they believed that uh, the jesus he became christ at the time of baptism and at the time of crucifixion christ has left jesus so they have various other understandings or thoughts concerning christ but the scripture clearly says that lord jesus christ uh, he was truly human and he was a true <coughs> god as well so if we don't believe in the humanity of the lord jesus christ then we will be denying the history which is attested by the eye witnesses we know that jesus christ was always ministering in uh, among the people there were times when thousands of people gathered around him and all such incidents it was written before us so that we can understand that there are or there were eye witnesses for the presence of lord jesus christ the jewish historians they acknowledge <coughs> we often uh, refer to 
uh, Josephus, and uh, we know that in his writings, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is pictured as a historical person. So if we deny the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we would be denying the history. And uh, the, the words said by the eyewitnesses, we know that out of the four Gospels, uh, Matthew was a disciple of the Lord Jesus. John was also a disciple of the Lord Jesus. And Mark, he was very closely observing these incidents. He was uh, there while our Lord was uh, on the way to uh, be crucified. Then uh, Luke, he is a, is a the basic historian in the New Testament. He, he went through <coughs> various facts and documents, and he tried to understand what is the truth. And then he brought before us the history of the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, he was writing to a nobleman, Theophilus, and he would not be writing a mere story. And the Lord Jesus Christ is a true human. He was a part of the history. And as we often say that history is his story. So if we deny the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be denying the history and the words said by the eyewitnesses. And if we deny this truth, then we will be deceivers and we would be considered as antichrist in a plural way. This is what we can read from 1 John chapter 4 and verses 2 and 3 and also in 2 John verse 7. We, there we read about the, uh, the word antichrist and antichrist is a person who is not willing to accept the person of Christ who is not willing to accept that uh, Jesus Christ came in the flesh. So if we deny this truth, then we will be deceivers and antichrist. Then 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1, we read that those who are born of God, they <coughs> would be truly believing this truth about the coming of Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh. So if we are not willing to accept this truth, then that means that we are not the children of God. So all true believers have no problem or no difficulty in understanding and in believing this truth. And uh, also in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 10, we read like this, if we are not willing to accept this truth, that we make God a liar. Now we know that God is true. As we read in Romans chapter 3, all men can become liars, but God is always true. A God who cannot lie, as we read in Titus chapter 1. So if we are not accepting what God has revealed unto us through his word, that we make God a liar. So how important it is for us to believe the humanity of Lord Jesus Christ. As an introduction, we have seen uh, these things. And now let us come to the very first point that Jesus Christ had a human parentage. Now, we would be looking to this aspect uh, in the remaining part of this class. Our Lord, he had a human parentage. When we come to the very first prophecy mentioned in the scripture concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, which is uttered by Jehovah himself. And what is that? That is what we see in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. I'm not going to uh, read it fully, but there we have that word, the seed of the woman. Her seed. The seed of the woman. So Lord Jesus Christ is pictured there as the Redeemer, and this Redeemer is, uh, is the seed of the woman. So that means that the Redeemer would be a true man. The Redeemer would be a man. So that is the first 
indication about the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we proceed and come to the various other passages of the word of God, we have ample, uh, uh, ample evidences to say that Lord Jesus Christ, he had the human parentage. Now, a few verses we have seen, or it is quoted here before you in the screen, so that uh, it would be easy for uh, us to note it down. When we come to Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, there we uh, read like this, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. See here, God sent forth his son, or other words, the son of God. And it is written that made of a woman. So that God or the son of God and the son of a woman or a son of man. That is what we can see in this verse. So he is called the seed of woman. Uh, one who is made of a woman. And when we come to the fact of his incarnation in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18, we read like this. Uh, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, but as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So <clears throat> there we read, uh, that our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, as he was, uh, as he was in the womb of Mary. So even before Joseph came and uh, met Mary, she was uh, she was big with child, and that child was because of the Holy Spirit. So she conceived because of the Holy Spirit by the power of the Holy Spirit. Again. We can understand that from that verse that speaks of the uh, of uh, Mary as the mother of Jesus. He had a human parentage. Matthew chapter two and verse eleven. Uh, we know how the Magi they went to meet the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in Bethlehem <coughs> after uh, a few uh, months or a, after. Uh, more than a year after the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they worshipped Jesus. And we read that they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 47, people, uh, they said unto him, Behold thy mother and thy brethren, because the, those people, they understood or they considered Mary as the mother of Jesus. John chapter 2 and verse 1, in connection with the marriage in Cana of Galilee, the mother of Jesus was there. John is clearly mentioning that. So these are various instances from the scripture which we can understand that he had a, a, a human parentage. Now, we have the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ described in Matthew chapter 1 and also in Luke chapter 3. We know the difference between these two genealogies and uh, in that, uh, in that uh, uh, two places where the genealogy is given, we can see that <coughs> we can see how uh, Lord Jesus Christ uh, is pictured as the son of Mary. Matthew chapter 1 is the genealogy of Joseph. And in, uh, in each and every case from uh, Abraham, as we read, we can see that uh, Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, like that it is going. But when it comes to Joseph, we don't read that Joseph begat Jesus, but we are uh, told that uh, Jesus Christ came out of Mary, Jesus, uh, Joseph is pictured only as the husband of Mary because Mary is the mother of Jesus. And in Luke chapter 3, 
we can see that that uh, genealogy is about the genealogy of Mary. And these two genealogies are also uh, bringing before us the truth concerning the human parentage of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we all know <coughs> from the scripture that Joseph was his foster father. He was not the biological father. He was the foster father. But Mary, she was uh, his biological mother. So, Lord Jesus Christ, he had a biological mother. As Jesus, in the, in the humanity of the Lord Jesus, he has a biological mother. But we have to guard one truth. There are people who say that Mary is the mother of God. And that is not a truth according to the scripture. It is true that Jesus Christ is God, but it is not right to call Mary as the mother of God. Mary is the mother of Jesus. Uh, I, he is the mother of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in his humanity. So it is not right to call her as the mother of God. Now, uh, let me go further. <coughs> when we come to scripture, there are places where Jesus Christ is called as the son of Joseph. I have uh, uh, written some verses in that connection. And when we look to the people who mentioned uh, this word, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So uh, when we look to these people, we can understand that, first of all, Philip was saying that. Now, Philip uh, said that uh, statement just after he found the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he was in the initial uh, moments of his acquaintance with the Lord. So he might not have understood uh, the truth concerning uh, the, the fact that uh, he is not the biological son of Joseph. Then we have uh, other people, the unbelieving Jews. Uh, they say that is, the, uh, is not this Jesus the son of Joseph? Uh, the, those people, they were not ready to believe on Jesus. Again, while our Lord was in Nazareth in Luke chapter 4, as they were uh, rejecting him, they said, is not this Joseph's son? So they were, <coughs> they, they were people who were either uh, ignorant of this truth or they were not believing this truth. But uh, we have to understand how the Holy Spirit moved Luke to uh, describe about uh, uh, the connection between the Lord Jesus Christ and Joseph. And Jesus himself, uh, in Luke chapter 3 and verse 23, we read that. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Eli. So there, the Holy Spirit uh, is clearly bringing before us the truth that Jesus Christ was supposed as the son of Joseph. So that is what we can see about the immediate parents of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we can see how our Lord is, uh, 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 is called as the seed of David. We have uh, various references where we can see that he is mentioned as the seed of David. Uh, when we come to uh, Romans chapter 1 and verse 3 concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. And some other verses also we have over here. And when we come to, uh, when we come to uh, Matthew chapter 1, uh, it is written that Jesus Christ, the son of David, and uh, he is the son of uh, Abraham. So there we can see he is mentioned as the son of David or the seed of David. So Lord Jesus Christ, uh, according in his, to his uh, uh, according to his flesh, we can say that he has uh, a biological connection with Mary. He has a biological connection with David, with Abraham, and even with Adam, 
Uh, that is what we can gather from the scripture. And now we are concentrating uh, on the uniqueness of his birth. <coughs> now that is the third thing we have to consider uh, in connection with uh, his human parentage. I want you to look to the uniqueness of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we look to the word of God, we can understand that people entered this world in four different ways at least. There are scholars who say that there are five uh, ways, but uh, uh, there are other people who say that there are four ways. And the, uh, another, the fifth way, which some scholars say, they uh, include it in these four ways. And the four ways are, first of all, uh, by creation. We know that Adam, he came into this world by creation. God created Adam. When there was nothing, God took the dust out of the ground and he made uh, the image of Adam. And then he, uh, he breathed uh, into the nostrils of Adam. So Adam became a living soul. So we can see that uh, in, in the next slide, we can see that uh, Adam, he came into existence by way of creation. God uh, brought, God made Adam. Now, when we come to Eve, we know that Eve was not made as Adam was made. Adam was made out of the dust. But Eve was formed out of Adam or out of one of the ribs of Adam. So the way he was made was different from the creation of Adam. So we can say that that is formation. Uh, Eve came into existence by formation, by uh, taking the one of the ribs of Adam. Eve came into existence. And God formed uh, a woman out of that rib. Then when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that he came uh, by way of incarnation. And then we all are in existence because of generation. We all are born from parents. Uh, that is generation. So we, these are the four ways... <coughs> People enter into uh, the this world. Now, when we come to when we look to this, the first three methods or three ways, we can understand that such acts were occurred only once. Only Adam was created like that. Only he was formed like that, and only Christ incarnated. But generation that is occurring yeah, every now and then. But we have to understand one thing. All these four things or these four methods are, uh, are uh, miracles of God. All these four things. The first three occurred only once. And the generation, that method of uh, people coming into existence that is occurring always but all these four methods are only because of the power of God. These are the miracles of God. <clears throat> and if you can believe in one miracle, you should not have a difficulty to believe in the other miracles also. If you have no difficulty in believing the generation then you should not have the difficulty to believe in creation or formation or incarnation. Because all these are works of God. And you cannot ask God to repeat any particular event. We can't ask God to repeat creation or incarnation. So that is all according to God's will and his authority. It is his So we can see that people came into existence into this world in these four ways. Now, as we proceed, I would like to concentrate on incarnation because we are 
uh, looking to the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is the meaning of that word incarnation? The word incarnation means taking on of the flesh and blood and all its other details or entails. Taking on of the flesh and blood. Or in other words, we can say that it is the infleshment means coming in flesh. We know that God is a spirit. The God who is a spirit, he is taking upon himself a body. <coughs> and with that body, he is coming into this world and living amongst us. That is incarnation. People of this world, they look to incarnation in a very different way. And according to them, there are various understandings, and at least one of them is they look to a person and see some speciality in that person, maybe some might or power or some speciality in that person, and they will make him. When we look to the incarnations of various faiths in this world or religions in this world, we can understand that all these incarnations are man becoming God. But when we come to the incarnation in the Bible, it is not man becoming God. It is God becoming man. It is God becoming man. We have to understand this difference. Now, <clears throat> we have various scripture portions uh, uh, before us where we can uh, understand very clearly that that word, uh, Taking on of the flesh is literally mentioned in these, uh, in these uh, passages. We have John 1 and 14, a very famous verse, which we often repeat, not only in this class, but also in various uh, uh, times in our life. We look to this uh, verse, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So there we can see that word. The word was made flesh. The logos, which was there from the beginning. The logos, which was there with God. The logos, which was God himself. The same logos was made flesh and dwelt among us. John the Apostle. He is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is saying that God became man. Word was made flesh. Hebrews chapter 2 is another portion that describes about the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. There we <coughs> read like this. And the word was made flesh. Sorry, uh, there we read like this. That he partook of the flesh and blood. Uh, the verse uh, written over here was uh, uh, was an error on uh, my part. Uh, kindly forgive. Uh, there in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. How our Lord, he, uh, he partook of the flesh and blood uh, because the children were partakers of uh, flesh and blood. Then again in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, there we uh, read in that great verse, God was manifest in the flesh. Then in Romans chapter 8 and verse 3, we read that God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. Always remember that Jesus Christ came in the likeness of sinful flesh but he was not in the sinful flesh. He was in flesh, but he was not in the sinful flesh. He was only in the likeness of the sinful flesh. Means he was like us. He was having a body like us. Uh, that is what we can gather from the scripture. Then we have to understand that in incarnation, he didn't, didn't set aside his uh, deity but he set aside his glory. 
it may, means that he retained all the attributes of deity. He never ceased to be God. While he was in this world, he was God himself. And he was, uh, uh, he was uh, uh, seen in the form of a man, but he was God and he continued to be God. He never ceased to be God. We have to understand this truth. And another thing we have to understand is this. In incarnation, he gave up the glory or he veiled his glory in the human flesh. As we read in uh, John chapter 17 and verse 5, we read like this. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee, before the world was. So Christ, in this high priestly prayer, he is looking to his God, the Father, and he is asking for that glory which he had before the world began, or he is looking for that uh, pre-incarnate glory. So he gave up the glory. And as he was in this world, he veiled his glory in the human flesh. See, no one could see the full glory of the Lord Jesus Christ if he didn't cover his glory. So with his flesh, he covered. It was like a robe for him. And people could look to him. They could talk to him. They could uh, uh, meet him. They could have an acquaintance with him because his glory was veiled. Then when we come to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7, we read, uh, he was made in the likeness of men. Also, we read that he took upon him the form of a servant. Second Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, we read that he became poor. The one who was rich, he became poor. So in incarnation, this is actually what we can see that was happened. He, he veiled his glory. He was made in the likeness of man. He, was, he took upon himself the form of a servant. And he became a poor man. Not only financially poor, but he became poor in every sense. So that is what happened in incarnation. So we have to understand the, the great change happened in connection with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who was seated on that exalted throne in glory. The one whose glory has filled the temple. The one before whom the seraphims were worshipping. Without rest, day and night. And with great fear, they covered their face. They covered their body. And they were uttering, He is holy, holy, and holy. So such a great God. In incarnation, He became a man like unto us. He became a man like unto us. And not only that, he became a servant. He became a servant. When we look to that upper room, we can see how our behaved like a servant. He worked like a slave. When we look to various aspects of our Lord Jesus Christ, we can see that not only that he worked like a slave at that moment, but he spoke like a slave. He obeyed like a slave. He was a true servant, a perfect servant. We often consider uh, the gospel according to Mark as a gospel that shows the servanthood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is true. But that doesn't mean that 
the other gospels <coughs> are not bringing that truth the servanthood of the lord jesus christ is visible in the gospel according to john also in matthew in luke in all these places we can see it in the epistles we can see all uh, the servanthood of the lord jesus christ he came as the servant of jehovah from heaven could say that behold my servant he took upon himself the form of a great change was it now in that upper room when our lord was willing to take the place of a slave look to his disciples not only that they were not they were not ready to take that place their heart was filled with the thought that who is the greatest among us their heart was in a different level often we are like that but look to the lord he was not thinking of his own greatness but he was ready to took upon himself the form of a servant people among whom he he mingled they looked to him as a man many of them they could not see the the real personality of god had in him they looked to him as a man but some of them by the grace of god understood this great truth and they believed in him the poverty of the lord jesus christ when we look meditate upon it the literal poverty we can see how our lord suffered in various ways and not only the physical or the financial poverty he became poor in every sense now why this incarnation was necessary the incarnation was <coughs> necessary because god has a greater plan god had the plan of the ultimate and perfect salvation of mankind and in order to achieve this goal in order to bring forth the salvation of mankind before god there is only one way and that way is sending his son as a man into this world when god made the first man he failed so god had to send a second man jesus christ came into this world as the second man now god has various other purposes which we can see in the following verses but let me tell you that the central theme before god is to accomplish our salvation and in order to accomplish our salvation a sacrifice is needed and that to the sacrifice of a sinless person a sinless substitute and in order to uh, in order to accomplish that sacrifice he has to come with a body he has to incarnate he has to come in flesh now around seven purposes for incarnation i have mentioned over here and i don't want to explain on this uh, uh, these aspects or these purposes uh, we have uh, mentioned it over there uh, uh, let me just enumerate it and go forward <clears throat> the purposes for incarnation the first one is to confirm god's promises unto the fathers we know that god has promised to abraham isaac and jacob so in order to confirm these promises god had to send his son or the lord jesus christ has to took upon himself a body and also in romans 15 and 9 we read that the gentiles might glorify god for his mercy so in order to reach the gentiles god has to bring his son when we come to genesis chapter 12 we know that the blessings of abraham there we read that uh, the blessing of abraham would be extending even unto the gentiles 
and Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. And for that, the Lord Jesus Christ had to come. <clears throat> then when we come to the New Testament, we can see that John in his epistle says like this, he has come to take away our sins. And when we come to Hebrews, we read about a high priest over there, a high priest who is faithful, who is sympathizing, who is a succoring high priest. Various verses are there. Uh, uh, we, can, we know those verses or we can go to those verses and understand that in order to fulfill the ministry of a high priest, our Lord, he had to come and prove himself as a man. And also, God had this in his mind. That when his son would come into this world, he will be revealing the father. That's why Lord Jesus Christ said like this. Those who have seen me have seen my father. I and the father are one. So he came to reveal the father. No one has seen God at any time. But the only begotten who is in his bosom has revealed him. So in order to reveal, he came. The incarnation was to destroy the works of the devil. Now, not only our salvation, the restoration of everything has its center in this redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for that to accomplish, he had to incarnate as a man. And not only that, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, we are told that our Lord Jesus Christ was a perfect example for us. When he was in this world, he, he showed us an example. And we are supposed to follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if we want to know what a true human being is, we have to look to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know how we have to live in this world, we have to look to the Lord Jesus Christ because he was the perfect man and he showed us an example. Often we look to other people who are around us and we try to follow them or we try to, uh, call, uh, we try to uh, say that because of them, we are doing this. We Take them for our excuses. But we are told not to follow anyone in this world. But we have to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, who is an example for us. So that is uh, the purpose of incarnation. To show us an example how to live in this world for the Lord. So seven purposes for incarnation we have seen uh, briefly without uh, much, uh, 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 much uh, uh, description. Now, in con <coughs> conclusion, I would like to turn your attention to the means of incarnation. The means of incarnation was the virgin birth. So, <clears throat> in order for Lord Jesus Christ to become a perfect mediator between a holy God and the sinful men, he has to have the quality of a God and a man. So he took upon himself the form of a man. He became a man. God became man. But if he comes just as we came into this world, then he could not become a holy person. He could not become a perfect man. So he had to come through the virgin birth. So the means of incarnation is the virgin birth. Why virgin birth? Because in order to become a, a, a right mediator between the holy God and the sinful man, he should have the qualities that's satisfying to both the parties, acceptable to both the parties. And he should know both the parties. He now being as God, he can know what, 
holy God is. And as man, he know what man is. So that is why he took the virgin birth. And not only that, as a perfect man and a perfect God, he could live in this world only through virgin birth. Otherwise, the sin of Adam would be transfer, would be uh, transfer, uh, transferred upon him, <coughs> and he would become a sinful man. So this, this was the only option that he would come through a virgin. There are many people who may question the virgin birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, but those who are true believers, uh, we don't have any doubt. But the Holy Scripture has given us various proofs about the virgin birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And five proofs of the virgin birth uh, I have enumerated over here from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Uh, there we can see that how this virgin birth is a truth mentioned in the Scripture. As believers, we are, we are believing what the scripture says. So there we read in verse 18 that before they came together, yeah, that means before Joseph and Mary came together, Mary <coughs> had <coughs> conceived. And that was by the Holy Spirit. So the fact of virgin birth, we can see over there. And in verse 19, we have the attitude of Joseph. He did not want to put her away. He did not want to, uh, uh, to bring some dishonor to Mary. He thought of uh, putting her away in a private way. Then we have the consolation to Joseph by the message of the angel. As he was meditating on these things, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him and told him the truth. Then in verse 22, we have the prophetic word. We have the word uh, from Isaiah, how the, how the Lord Jesus Christ would come out of a virgin. And also we read that in verse 25, chapter 1 and verse 25, they abstained till they had the firstborn child. So... <clears throat> We can understand from these, uh, these passages that the virgin birth is, is very clearly mentioned in the pages of the scripture. Now, as we look to the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have seen Humanity. It is not a sinless humanity like us, but it was a holy humanity, perfect humanity. He didn't inherit the sinful nature of Adam <coughs> because his conception was of the Holy Spirit. And we can look to him and say, in him there was no sin. As the hymn writer says, we also could look to the Lord Jesus Christ. And say that, hallelujah, what a savior. As we behold the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ, this truth of God manifesting in flesh, let our hearts be filled with adoration because of the great concern of God the Father for us, the love of God the Father for us. And let us worship him in spirit and in truth. May God bless us with these thoughts in the days to come. Amen.